Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone here. Welcome to our visitors this morning. Um, Jason is performing a wedding this weekend for a relative, so the um, young family are in Lake Michigan. I don't even know for sure. Um, announcements. Election day is coming up November the 2nd. We're going to be serving carryout only from 4 to 7 p.m. I have sent an email out to um, the people on our list asking for donations of pies and chickens. And so far I've only got one response, so hopefully they'll see it and start responding soon. Uh, trunk or treat is going to be on Sunday, October the 31st from 2 to 4. And that is also Galena's trick or treat evening, but I don't know what time that starts, but 2 to 4 for Galena. October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Please find ways to encourage your pastor and his family this month. And that's all the announcements that I have. Um, as you see, we don't have the um, slides on, so you've got to follow your bulletin this morning. So please join me in the call to worship. For God alone, our souls wait in silence, for our hope is in God. He alone is my rock of salvation. With God my fortress, I shall not be shaken. With God rests my deliverance and honor. God is my mighty rock and refuge. May we always trust in God and pour out our hearts.
Our scripture this morning is from Jonah, the third chapter, reading verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, for the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our prayer requests this morning hit home pretty closely because we're still praying for COVID infections and vaccinations. And one of our own family has been um, uh, has COVID now, and we give prayers for the Hillier family. Jason has COVID, and um, so it makes a big hole in our in our congregation this morning. So please keep the Hilliers in your prayers. Let's uh, join in silent prayer for ourselves and families of the church and our community as we meditate on what God has told us in Scripture and is even now telling us through the still, small voice of His Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, in and through Jesus, you make known to your healing will and your saving desire. In him you give life as fresh as on the first day of creation, without fanfare and without fuss. You bring us wholeness as we journey on our way, asking nothing from us except that we remember and give you thanks. And that we in turn offer your good gifts to those around us who are in need. O God, we thank you and we praise you. Like the Samaritan leper you healed, we return your gratitude to you. Father, so often we come to you as the God who gives us what we want, rather than as the God who is able to give us what we really need. Teach us the wisdom that comes from looking at the world with a view broader than that of just our desires. Help us to not only pray for our daily bread, but for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done. Help us to not only pray for physical healing, but also for the ability to live abundantly in your Holy Spirit. Bless us with a life that is more than normal. Help us to be aware of your goodness day by day and to witness to your power and your love by all our words and our actions. Father, we pray today for all those who are afflicted by disease and hunger, by war and by terrorism. For them we pray that life will be blessed and that their needs will be met, and more that they may also not only receive healing or food for their bodies, but that they may not only know the absence of violence and fear, and that they be blessed as well with any spiritual healing and any spiritual food that they may need. Remember that we pray for the Hillier family in particular as they struggle with the pandemic. Lord, here are our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession to you as we remember the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
We're going to be doing verses 1 and 4 of the hymn 435, O God of Every Nation, verses 1 and 4. So you can read this at the community library if you're, if you're interested. So let's take a look at the Jonah story. Jonah is asked to go to the city of Nineveh and preach repentance. Context is important here because to the ancient readers of the book of Jonah, Nineveh would have meant Assyria. The Assyrians were known for their brutal and callous treatment of other people. And Nineveh was an actual city near uh, Mosul, Iraq today. And there's been archaeology done in Nineveh. And they found a monument in which one of the kings bragged about after conquering a city-state, cutting off the feet, the hands, the ears, and even the lips of those people that he had conquered. That's probably hyperbole. It's probably just was meant to scare people. But that was their reputation. And you can see why Jonah 
would be very hesitant to follow through on God's request. So Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, goes in the opposite direction, gets on a ship, heads in the opposite direction, and, of course, there is a big storm. And Jonah, as a man of God, what's his response to this threat, to the lives of the, of the sailors on the boat, to the possibility that everybody could perish? Jonah goes down in the hold and goes to sleep. In contrast, the sailors on the boat, what do they do? They do practical things like trying to throw cargo over the, over the side to lighten the load, make the vessel float higher in the water, less threatened with swamping, and they pray. In fact, the captain goes down to Jonah, wakes him up, and says, our prayers aren't working. Pray to Yahweh. You're a Hebrew. Pray, pray to your God. So, in contrast, this is multiple times in the story of Jonah, where instead of Jonah, the man of God, acting like a man of God, it's the other people, the foreigners, the people who worship other gods that act more like a God-fearing man than Jonah. So Jonah confesses that he's probably the reason that this storm has occurred. And he says, throw me overboard. The storm will end. And the sailors say, whoa, we're not going to do that. So they try and row to shore, but the storm is too great. So finally they come back to Jonah and say, and decide, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do as you ask. But what do they do? Again, they pray to Yahweh and say, don't hold us responsible for the death of this man. So again, they're acting more like god praying people than Jonah. And this is where the fish story comes in that we all know and have heard so long. And then miraculously, Jonah is brought back to dry land, and God asks a second time. Jonah gets a second chance. God asks Jonah again, go to Nunavites. And he agrees this time. He spent three days in the belly of the whale as made him see the light. So he goes to Nineveh and preaches the world's shortest sermon. Forty days more, Nineveh will be overturned. Seven words, the world's shortest sermon. And as you heard from the scripture that was read today, it actually works. And what do the Ninevites do? They respond by fasting and putting on sackcloth. This is something that Israelites have been do had been doing since time immemorial. Every Israelite that read that story would understand these people are acting in god fearing ways. Even the king takes it a step further. He puts on sackcloth and sits in ashes. So, Jonah becomes the world's most successful prophet. No other prophet in the whole Bible had the success that Jonah had. So, what's Jonah's response? Does he celebrate? No. He gets angry at God. He gets angry and fesses up. He says, that's why I ran away, because I knew you were going to be merciful. You are a merciful God, and you would show compassion 
He couldn't stand the idea of God showing mercy and compassion to his enemies. He was in a cycle of judgment and condemnation. Now, we could see ourselves in that story of Jonah acting unlike God-fearing people, fearing people that look different from us, that act different from us. In this environment, as Election Day is coming up, people that think differently than us, that vote differently than us. And we can, how many times have we seen people of other faith faith acting more like God-fearing people than we are. But that's not where the Jonah story ends. I'm going to read the end of the Jonah story. It's only four chapters. In some Bibles, it's actually only two pages. In this Bible translation and printing, it's actually four pages. But this is the way the story ends. Jonah went out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then, then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at the dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and said it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? The word of God for the people of God. There was an experiment done in 2013 by some professors at UCLA. They invited 100 students, students who were total strangers, and asked them to play games of Monopoly. Now, these were not your standard games of Monopoly. These were rigged games of Monopoly in the sense that at the beginning of each game, with the toss of a coin, one player would be identified as a rich player, and one would be identified as a poor player. The rich player would get twice as much money as the poor player, and every time you went around the board, get twice as much money. Now, as you would expect, the rich players generally won the game. But what you might not expect is that during the course of the games, the rich players would start to be rude and dismissive to the poor players. They would, as they went around the board, they would smack their pieces on the board. They would do things like, uh, you know, front fist pumps when they would win a property. And there was a, even a, a bowl of snacks, pretzels, on the table. They would start to eat more of the pretzels than the poor, the poor players. And then after the games, the professors went to these students, and everybody knew by this time it had been a rigged game. 
talk to the kids that had been the rich players to ask them about their experiences. And they, every one of them, made a point about how they had made particular plays or taken certain advantage and how skillful their playing was. It's so easy for us to see positions of privilege as warranted and merited when they're not. By the, by the end of the book of Jonah, Jonah had been blessed multiple times by God. He'd been saved from drowning, miraculously brought back to dry land, had the world's most successful sermon, and was at least temporarily shaded from an oppressive sun. As a man of God, Jonah assumed that he deserved all these good things from God. But what he couldn't imagine was God's passion and compassion and mercy being extended to people that he hated. He was in a cycle of judgment and condemnation. It's a pattern we too often get caught in. We envision someone's appearance as an issue. We see their status, whether good or bad. And we never take into account all the many, many factors that went into determining how they attained that status or why they look like they do. People on the margins of society have been facing invisible forms of prejudice that we don't even perceive. It's so easy to get caught in judgment and condemnation. Father Gregory Boy, or Boy, B-O-Y-L-E, Gregory Boy, is a Jesuit, Jesuit priest who works in the gang-infested neighborhoods of Los Angeles. He created a program called uh, Homeboy Industries, which finds ways for former gang members to become productive members of society. He tells us that the measure of our compassion lies in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with each other, with folks who are on the margins. And we have to fight, he suggests, against the natural tendency to see some lives as less valuable than other lives. And the way to do that, he says, is through service. In serving others, we move towards compassion. It allows us to stand in awe of what a person carries rather than standing in judgment of how they carry it. That's worth repeating. Service allows us to stand in awe of what another person has to carry instead of standing in judgment of how they carry it. When Jonah delivered his sermon, he basically just marched through Nineveh. Didn't look to the right or left, didn't perceive anything about the city, didn't stop to talk to anyone didn't have any relationships with anyone. It wasn't service. It wasn't relational. How could we not expect him to be 
judgmental. God loved the petulant prophet Jonah. God loved the Ninevites despite what they had done to conquer much of the world. And God loves us even though we so frequently don't show compassion to the people we don't like and don't know. God is calling us to our Ninevites, to those people that we can't imagine giving compassion to. We can flee from that call. We can downright ignore that call. But imagine what might happen if we actually answer that call. Amen. sent forth by God's blessing. Go in peace.